Welcome to The Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day, and particularly the power of governments and companies. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director of Privacy International. But importantly, today, I'm here with my colleague, Millie. Hi, Gus. Millie is here to talk about something she's been working on for a ridiculous amount of time, and it is cloud extraction. So this is talked about by many of the experts as this is the future, this is the gold mine, this is what we want. There's so much here, it's so much easier to get than if someone's really made it difficult for us to get into their phone. So let's just start with the mobile phone extraction. I think one of the key things to think about from the start is we're talking about when a law enforcement or government has physical possession of your device. There are other ways of getting into your device if they don't have that, but we're very much focusing on them having your device, plugging it into something and being able to take everything off your phone. There are degrees to which they can take everything off, depending on the phone you use, the operating system, and whether you've taken additional measures to make it hard for someone to get in. But it's essentially that physical access to the device and taking everything off. Sounds exactly like what happened with the FBI and the Apple fight a couple of years ago, or three or four years ago. Exactly. So they had physical possession of that device and they wanted to find out what was on it. And because of the nature of that mobile phone, it was difficult but not necessarily impossible to get into it. And so if I recall correctly, in your first round of work, you were able to uh, actually use this type of technology and see it in action. What did you find? Yeah, so we tested it out on three different phones. We used a Celebrite UFED Touch 2, which is possibly a bit of an older model to what a lot of law enforcement would use now. And that is an iPad-sized device. You plug your phone into it. And essentially, it will try and recognize your phone. And if it does or it thinks it can extract it, it will give you three different options of extraction. And you choose which one you want to do. And then it will take everything off it. And so we did that to three of my phones. And even though I knew what was coming, it was terrifying to see all your data presented in a way that law enforcement would see it. But even to see it yourself, in one place. You don't often have that experience where you really see all your browsing history, all your emails, all your text messages, and then all the deleted items that you're not expecting are still there. So that was a real eye-opener, just to really see the vast amount of data rather than just to write, it's a lot of data. Yeah, absolutely. And so the situation would be you're a bad person, the police tackle you or they arrest you and they and they seize your device and they take it to a back room, plug it in and get access. Is this the scenario of use? There are many different scenarios. So it can be if you're a victim and you've got information you want to provide to the police, if you're a suspect and if you're a witness. So if those you're a witness? Will, so those will have very different implications in terms of what position you are in in the criminal justice system and how that might feel as well um, and what law is relevant and how you're protected as well when you present your phone and say, I've got something here, or the police say, we think they've got something and we may or may not tell them we're taking that information. And it's it's almost like the fact that you were able to identify deleted information, things that you thought you no longer had on your device and they were there for searching, it almost makes it even more invasive than a a thorough questioning under law. This is the really interesting discussion, is if you think about someone who is, say, 40 or 50 years old now, you search their devices, it will only go back a certain length of time. You search someone's devices in five or 10 years' time, who's had a phone since they were 10 years old, that amount of information is enormous and you're not just talking about the information there you're talking about how you can look and investigate and interrogate that data and draw assumptions not just as an individual police officer but the software that these companies will provide will come up with different assessments of you as an individual so you might not even remember what you did yesterday what you did 10 years ago who you interacted with and what they're like now but the software will allow the police to do that. Wow. And it's not just the police. Like, I think I remember reading a story about how one European government, I think it was the Austrian government, was going to use this capability on migrants. 
Yeah, I think it's used at the border as well. I think in Germany, that's where I've heard of it happening. But when we've tried to ask in the UK, is this happening at the border here? It's been very hard to get any clear information about whether they're using it. I would be surprised if other agencies aren't using it and other government authorities and certainly in the rest of Europe and the rest of the world, who knows who it's being sold to because there are many different companies And there are some very public ones and there are some very private ones. So some of this technology is very hard. If you're talking about the newest iPhone or encrypted phones or broken phones, and some of it's very easy if you're talking about widely available device that's quite old, maybe a Samsung or something like that. Wow. And just some some larger context points. Last year, the data came out about how often the U.S. government is actually searching people's laptops and phones at the border without a warrant. And it's in the tens of thousands now, whereas a few years ago, it was relatively rare. So I imagine it's because they have easier access to this technology. But also in our sector, we've heard very worrying stories about how people who work in the human rights field are getting stopped and searched and having their devices taken. There was a horrible case in Tanzania a year and a half ago where that happened to two employees of a U.S. organization that promotes free expression. So this is not just an isolated situation. And from when you started covering this two years ago, three years ago, nobody was talking about it. Then you had the Apple versus FBI and then all these new data points. And then, of course, when you launched your report two years ago, it was really high profile for a while. Yeah, and I think there are so many different contexts in which this is used. And that's why, depending on which country you're in, who they're using this against, which authorities this is available to it's going to be a very different level of risk and questions you're going to be asking and particularly if it's the border you're always in a more vulnerable situation there than perhaps at many other times in your life although obviously particularly vulnerable if you're uh, going to a police station and there's a real power imbalance so so this a lot of the use of this goes back to the power imbalance between the individual and the state or the authority who is using this what power do you have to know what's happening? Are you always going to even know that it has happened and to question it and to know what happens to all that information about you, your friends, your family, your kids, your colleagues, people you don't even remember you messaged or have photos of on your phone. And so it's one of those problems that you can see it in so many different ways in different contexts. And so when trying to deal with it and challenge it, you need to scale it down and think, well, how are we going to address this for this particular type of person? It still blows my mind, the fact that you saw data on your device that you didn't even know was there. You saw data on your device that you thought you'd gotten rid of. This lack of control you have over a device that is so intimate that you take everywhere. It's, it's extraordinary to think that you have no control over it. So then some of this burden of rectifying the situation just doesn't only fall on law enforcement. It's about the companies who build these devices. But as if that wasn't bad enough, what you've been doing since then has been even more problematic. Can you describe that? Yes. So in doing a lot of the research around mobile phone extraction, it became increasingly apparent that the direction this was going was not looking at how to crack every phone. The focus was, let's get into the cloud. And there are many reasons for this kind of development in digital forensics. One, it's quite hard to get into a lot of phones. So this is seen as much, much easier. There's also a lot more information there in many respects. So if you describe for, say, the average person, let's imagine you. Mm -hmm. So if they were to access your device and then get access to this cloud data, what kind of cloud data on you would they be able to access? Uh, So if you back up, your WhatsApp messages, or you don't realize they're being backed up, it would be all your WhatsApp messages. If you store your photos, which most people take tons of photos all the time, they're not going to all be on your phone, they're going to be backed up. So it could be in your iCloud, or your Google Photos, or whichever service you use to store your photographs. When you take it on your phone, it will then backed up and it goes to what people call the cloud. Um, but essentially your provider service, all your social media, so Twitter information, Instagram, and then also thinking about other services like Uber, that's all held on remote servers. The other area would be, if you think about employment, like Slack. So that's all held in the cloud. 
what other things? So the other thing that a lot of companies talk about, which they really love and, and get very excited about, is the like smart devices. So if you think of Amazon Alexa, Google Home, your voice recordings, your searches, which reveal so much about the patterns of your daily life. If you think about what someone's saying to their smart device, like set the alarm, put the music on, add this to my shopping list, you know, search for this product. There's a whole area where we reveal so much more about ourselves than we ever did before, which is why it's seen as this goldmine of information. And then there are other random things like booking.com, Facebook, of course, and then all your Amazon shopping. And then if you look more deeply into products like Google, you've got much more stored in the cloud in terms of Google, like your location, your history, and then obviously photos, emails. So it was bad enough that when they took your device, the authorities can see everything that was there, even the things that you didn't know was there. But now it's sounding like it gets to peer into every aspect of your life that's not even on the phone. Yeah, and one of the things we're going to start looking at is how do you even know what's there yourself? So if you think about a lot of people um, over the last few years have been asking companies, what data do you hold on me? Yeah. Um, And been really shocked at the results. Now, imagine if you had to do that for every app on your phone or every app you may have had and forgotten about and deleted and then try and see what's held about you. It's a huge amount, but there was also a test done by one of the providers, Alcomsoft, where they said, can we see more using our device than if you look at your cloud accounts? And essentially they said, using our device compared to logging in as a user, we get way more. What? They get to see more into your own accounts than you as a user can? According to them. (laughs) What? So the other thing that a lot of the companies are very keen to promote that uh, is particularly linked to the cloud extraction software is facial recognition, emotion recognition, uh, identification of, I think, gender and age they promote as well. So they're saying, look, at we can get so much from the cloud. Think how many photos are there. So to try to draw the larger picture, just so I can make sure I've got this right, there are the... The companies who are building the technologies that allow for this type of access or what you call extraction. Um, so there are vendors who sell predominantly to law enforcement agencies. So let's, yeah, they're the, the vendors. But then there's the mobile phone companies, the ones that we spend a lot of money giving them money so they can give us good devices that are supposed to be relatively secure. And that was the topic of your first report a couple of years ago. And that's also the discussion around Apple versus FBI and all the fights that seem to keep on re-emerging about terrorist phones that the government needs to have access to. Well, technically, they can have access to it when they use this technology from these vendors. But now what you're talking about is about the companies that we tend to interact with quite intimately in the sense that these are the Facebooks and the Googles and the Instagrams of the world who we, we, we install on our phones and we invite into our lives and they, they store our data in, in this cloud or their clouds. And these companies have spent a lot of time also trying to convince us that they care about security and they protect our data even though, you know, at PI, we're a little cynical about this. But we honestly thought that these companies took security relatively seriously, particularly in light of major hacks over the years and vulnerabilities noticed around elections. And you're coming along saying that these vendors have found a way right through the security of all these systems? In a sense, yes, because all they need is the tokens from your device. And then they're in if they have developed the technology to take the data from those apps Uh, and like I talked before you know the product updates say we can now get into Fitbit we can now get into all these Google products Dropbox Apple Watch and so I think this type of technology does put more pressure on companies that essentially a, a lot of the time are seen as social network companies but I think we're talking more broadly than that basically any company that stores data in the cloud that provides you with an app and can be accessed. So it's more than social networks. I'm not sure how we could sort of encompass them all in one word. And they need to be saying something because what this technology allows 
is a way to get around them ever knowing that this is happening. So how, how would they know that you had had all the apps on your phone accessed by law enforcement, particularly if you didn't know either? How are they protecting their customers' data? Because we're not just talking about suspects here, we're talking about victims and witnesses too. But just because you're a suspect doesn't mean that you should have all your cloud stored data accessed by police and retained on their databases. And when a company called NSO Group, which has a reputation for producing various tools for law enforcement and intelligence agencies, supposedly produced, I think it was a piece of malware that allowed them to remotely access this kind of cloud stored data. So not without physical access, but remotely. A lot of the big companies like Google and Facebook, I think, all said, we don't think they can access our customers' products or our customers' data. The thing is with this, there are at least three companies whose promotional material I've looked at and analysed, and there's a lot more companies than those two whose customer data can be accessed. So we wrote to them and asked a very broad question. What are you doing about this? Do you have a position? And how are you going to protect customer data when there's essentially a way round getting a warrant and asking you for this? Uh, Some of them have responded, some of them haven't. And I think that's something that people should also be asking the providers, you know, the social networks whose services you use. Well, what are you doing to protect my data? I've heard about this tool that can be used by the police or by governments. How are you ever going to protect my data? And given the vast quantities that are now generated by the services that you encourage me to use... And I hope that that is something that will happen and that these companies will become more outspoken. When we hear about various companies and involvement in, say, the criminal justice system, a lot of the time it's about, well, Amazon are resisting a warrant that they've received from the police uh, in relation to a user's Echo device in relation to a criminal offence that happened or Apple are resisting a warrant that's demanding this certain information, or Google are resisting for certain location information unless the warrant's much more specific. So that's interesting, isn't it? They resist it unless it's more specific about what data about my customer do you really need and want. But this technology turns that on its head. You can get everything. The company doesn't know, and it's not limited at all. And I showed you a very small part of the information Google holds on me was my uh, Google My Activity. Now, that's uh, not everything Google holds on it. I showed you, what, a day and a half? Yeah, and I, I, I felt incredibly uncomfortable looking through this. It, it's, I, I, I couldn't believe that Google had... Of course, Google has your searches if you're logged in at the time of doing searches, although I'm a little disappointed that it doesn't have your work searches that you were logged in by accident, practically. But what was fascinating is that they also had every time you opened up WhatsApp, every time you opened up Signal. And so if Google has this data, and maybe your phone doesn't have that data, maybe it has the fact that you have Signal, but doesn't have all the data of like when you opened it. But Google, for some ridiculous reason, has all this data. And so now it's accessible to law enforcement the moment they take your phone. And first of all, you have no knowledge of the fact that Google knows this. Second of all, Google is basically saying, we don't want to know that this is possible because we're not going to do anything about it. Is that really the situation we're in? Well, I use an Android phone, so in part, it's my fault for <laughs> <laughs> choosing that. But um, I just sort of quite like the idea of the new Pixel phone. Uh, and occasionally I change my settings and wipe things, but I do like to sometimes see if I leave it running what does it show? And then say I'll log on to my Gmail, which is not my predominant email, but that I use for certain purposes. And I'll do that at work because it may relate to something I need to know for work. And then I'll forget to log out. And then it logs everything that I then do if I use the Chrome browser rather than a different browser, as well as everything I do at home. So you saw it has my clock. So it tells you what time I turned off my alarm. I knew it, I know I know what time you wake up. Well, Google knows what times you wake yeah. up. Yeah. And that you know day. that's obviously I use that phone, but it's the fact that 
that is a small snapshot of what law enforcement would get just through getting my activity. And that's not the whole remit of Google products. There's obviously like Drive, Chrome stuff, Calendar, Fit if you use that, Keep and all those things. But it just shows you when you talk about what's on your phone versus what's in the cloud, that's the cloud and it's more. Earlier, I was talking about that case of two employees of an American human rights organization who were in Tanzania and and they had their devices seized by the authorities from their hotels. Apparently, the authorities were even using their phones and tweeting from their phones saying, oh, everything's fine, but sending tweets in their name. So that story caused a great amount of concern in our sector saying we're at risk when we travel to some parts of the world if the phones are seized. But I'm getting the impression that that's a feature of these systems. It is. It's a well-promoted feature is that once you can access an individual's cloud accounts, that then allows you continual tracking. And that's certainly something that Celebrite promotes in relation to their cloud extraction tool, is that you can track online behavior, analyze posts, likes, events, connections, to better understand a suspect or a victim's interests, relationships, opinions, and daily activities. And the lead on from that, like you said, is could you then impersonate that individual? What on earth does that mean if you are able to send messages as law enforcement, not that individual? And it's kind of terrifying because then where does it start and stop? And how does that individual ever know if there are ways to get around, say, two-factor authentication or notification that someone's been using it? We're aware for many applications, there are ways of seeing when was it used, you get notifications. But if the vendors are trying to be at the forefront of this and to sell their product and say it's the best, they're going to find ways that you as a user are not notified. And so this sounds extraordinarily useful to law enforcement agencies and border agencies and intelligence agencies and to many other actors who would want to have access to this level of data, because you're not just talking about getting access to what's on the phone, but you're saying it's potentially access to your whole digital life with even the extra mile of impersonation. Now, do we have an understanding based on your research to what extent this is actually being purchased? And as we discussed earlier, this type of capability is being deployed at the US border for their laptop searches. I'm sure it's used in investigations and in court cases. What do we know about the use? I think one of the things that I found the most <laughs> the most useful source, in fact, is, is Celebrite, which is one of the vendors itself. And so what, how accurate this is, I don't know. But they said in their annual trend survey that in approximately half of all investigations, cloud data appears and that typically this data involves social media or application data that does not reside on the physical device. So this might relate to all law enforcement using Celebrite devices, okay? So you have to work, you know, we don't know how accurate this is in terms of global use, but for them, who's one of the top vendors of these tools, half of all investigations involve cloud extraction. That's extraordinary, but... I guess if they have the technology, which it sounds like they've procured it, they're just going to grab every phone they can and plug it in. It just sounds like this is customary processing now. Yeah, well, why wouldn't you use it? That's the thing is it's not just sold as as obtaining the data. You're also getting the the way it's visualized for you and the way it, the data is analyzed. It's really good technology in that respect. If you're law enforcement, it's it's easy to use. It's incredible what it can give you, I imagine, which is why they all want to use it. And we could have a whole other discussion about digital forensics and the problems that the ease of which you can use these devices is creating for quality and reliability of evidence. And that's a big discussion that's happening in the UK and other countries is if you can push a button and get all of this, how can you say it's reliable if you don't even understand how you got it. You're, you're killing my brain. Um, let's, uh, let's draw it there for a moment, and then we'll come back and we'll put this story in the context of other recent news stories we've come across in the past couple of weeks. Great. Great. 
so in this section, we want to cover some of the recent news and try to weave it into what we were just discussing, Millie, around cloud extraction and mobile phone extraction. And uh, it's never a boring week. It's never a boring month at PI. And we are news junkies. I mean, we do the best we can to keep an eye on what's going on across the world. But there's just so much. So in this part of the podcast, we'll just pick out a few. And it's almost unintentionally that the the overlap with some of the issues you raise are there in that one of the first news stories I thought we'd talk about is the fact that uh, there was some coverage of how Apple apparently, despite all their fights with the FBI around access to the phones, Apple had been planning on encrypting the data in phone backups in iCloud. But apparently the FBI complained about this and Apple decided not to. So Apple, that spends all of its time talking about how it cares about security and wants to make sure that your device is kept secure. Apple had no problem, apparently, according to this story, acquiescing to the FBI when it comes to ensuring that iCloud itself remains unencrypted. So I guess that means if a phone is plugged in by using one of these technologies you were just discussing, yeah, sure, they might not be able to get access to the phone, but they could still go to Apple and get all the data because it's sitting easily accessible to Apple. That just seems nuts. Well, they're not necessarily going to Apple either, are they? That's the thing is they can just bypass Apple and go straight to the to everything that's stored in the cloud if they use a technology that allows them to do that. And I, I've, I've briefly been an Apple user on and off, but I have no idea what would be stored in the backups. I'm assuming that that wouldn't necessarily just be Apple's own data, it would be, do you have your WhatsApp backed up to Apple iCloud? What else is in there? How are you meant to understand that as a customer using an Apple device? So this, in a way, goes back to the device manufacturers as well, doesn't it? Because we talked a bit more about the companies that provide you with the apps, but then we can go back to the, the phone manufacturers and say, well, what are they providing if it's not, say, Android or, or iCloud, where it's backed up? How can you look at that? How can you see what's there? How can you say, well, I don't think that law enforcement should have access to that point blank. And this reminds me of a conversation I saw on Twitter amongst security researchers who were noting that for WhatsApp users, I use WhatsApp relatively little, but I use it for uh, communicating with other parents. And I'm always getting this nag from WhatsApp to to back up my conversations. Like I have no interest in my conversations being backed up. But now I'm wondering if WhatsApp, which is supposed to be end-to-end encrypted, and for all intents and purposes, we have no reason to doubt that, but maybe they're offering this backup as, as an out as well for law enforcement. Maybe the FBI complained to them too, and so WhatsApp said, okay, well, the best thing we can do is make sure everybody gets nagged to death to back up all their conversations unencrypted to the cloud that can be accessed through this route. And when we're talking about the big tech companies, I think from what I've seen so far, the difference between Apple and Google's responses to this is going to flip on its head how we think about these two companies in terms of providing security for their customer data. And certainly the response I've received from Apple, I thought was particularly weak. And the response I received from Google, I thought was particularly strong. So interesting challenge for us as we think about what does it mean to have a degree of security for your data as a user of a smartphone, which is pretty much everybody? Yeah. And lifting on that in some of the issues we've discussed around, say, use at borders and what apps are actually doing. The Wall Street Journal had a uh, expose, which went into remarkable detail about how U.S. federal agencies, particularly when it comes to border enforcement, were accessing cell phone location data for immigration enforcement, but it wasn't from the telephone companies. It seems like it was from the apps that people use on their phone were leaking location data to data brokers and law enforcement agencies and immigration authorities in the U.S. were just paid customers of these data brokers. So it sounds like our entire approach to how we regulate law enforcement, how we ensure things like the Fourth Amendment or Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights or all the other constitutional protections around privacy, they all have this idea that there be law enforcement and there be in the individual. 
we have to rethink all of this because it's not even like in the past few years, we, we, we've learned, okay, there'd be law enforcement, there'd be a mobile phone company, and, and then the individual. But now there's just so many other actors that we didn't even know about. So who would have thought that it'd be entirely legal under U.S. law for law enforcement agencies to get access to location data, even though there's a Supreme Court decision on this uh, a few years ago saying that they should not get access to location data from telephone companies, but they can from data brokers via apps that people have no idea about. And given that there was a case recently in Europe where thousands of people or cases were chucked out because of the inaccuracies of cell phone location data provided by the telecommunications companies, what does that mean for the information that's provided by a data broker who has got it from an app? And who on earth is going to be able to challenge that and and look at the, the chain that that has come through? So if you're talking about at the border and someone says, well, you're not coming in or, you know, this is going to happen because of your location data that we know about, you're going to be in a very difficult position. But equally, if you're in the country and you're going through criminal justice proceedings and they say, this is the location data we know. Is your lawyer going to understand that? Is your lawyer going to understand how to challenge it? Do you have money for an expert who can look at this? What kind of forensic expert are you talking about? And are there about two in the country who would really be able to challenge this? And will you get funding to be able to do it to the extent it would require to prove that this location is data is wrong because more often than not you will find people will say well it came from a computer so we trust it we don't trust the individual and that dynamic is really worrying if we don't know the the provenance or the source of huge volumes of data particularly location that's so important when you're talking about some of these immigration and criminal law issues. Exactly. And talking about criminal law issues in an area where um, the companies are trying to be seen a little bit more positive, the New York Times had an expose about a company called Clearview AI, which is a facial recognition firm that apparently has been, uh, subsequent reporting has identified that this being sold around the world. What this company is doing is that um, it's getting images of faces by scraping the web, including social media. So the social networking companies are getting a little annoyed saying, hey, you're not allowed to scrape facial images to build this database to basically sell your wares around the world. It's okay for the social networking companies to do that. Or from what you were ta- we were talking about at the beginning, it's okay for law enforcement to do that through this really strange trajectory through your mobile phone. But now the companies are annoyed because the New York Times uncovered it, that there's this firm called Clearview AI. And what was even more interesting, if it wasn't bad enough that they were scraping social media, the journalist at the New York Times who uncovered the story when she was talking to a law enforcement agency that had the software and the system installed, and the police officer did a search of her, the company knew. So it's not just that the company is selling this technology to law enforcement agencies around the world. They're also monitoring how it's being used. So they know everybody who's being searched for anywhere on the planet, which is extraordinary. You, there's almost like a Bond villain kind of uh, scenario, but in the facial recognition sphere. Yeah, and if you if you look at some of, um, you know, I'm sure everyone <laughs> likes to do the privacy policy of some of these technologies and the cloud extraction ones, they allow remote access. So in a similar way that Clearview AI would be able to see that a search was happening, what does it mean for Celebrite to have remote access to their cloud extraction technology used by a certain law enforcement? Uh, and, and what are they then learning or what do they be able to access? And the other thing as well, that when you were talking about the images that were scraped or that could be analysed, that also brings to mind again, is the history. Who's going to be most implicated in this over time? Whose images are going to be up there over the next 10, 20 years that they can trace particular individuals over such a long time? How many images of you are up on Twitter and go back how long? Not long compared to your average 15, 20-year-old, probably. Yeah, indeed. These news stories I find offensive on on privacy grounds, of course, and on, on human rights grounds, but also on grounds of just utter stupidity of the infrastructure that we're building. And this brings me to the story that not too long ago, actually, it was uncovered that 
one of the major political parties in Israel had a data breach where 6.5 million records of Israeli voters was leaked online. And this is actually uh, the current prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu's party. And the reason that I find this story particularly interesting is that about seven or eight years ago, I was invited to a conference that was being hosted in Israel, and the opening speaker was Netanyahu. And this was on the back of where their own national ID system had had a data breach. And he was livid about this. And so his speech was all about how we have to start treating the security of people's data as a national security issue. And I thought that was an excellent speech because it, it turned everything upside down, which is, oh, because of national security, we must be able to peer into everybody's lives. But no, it's the other way around, which is because of the security of the nation, we must protect people's data. But unfortunately, all these years later, the political process doesn't really care about it so much. And political parties want to have as much data as they can on people, yet they don't want to go through the hard work of keeping that secure. And I think the inaction by politicians and governments to deal with this is incredibly frustrating. You know, we can we can raise the issues, we can research the issues, we can campaign on the issues, we can get the public to know about these issues, we can get the police to respond to these issues. But unless the government actually takes some form of action and says, do you know what, relying on legislation from the 80s to deal with this, referring to this data as akin to a briefcase is not right, then how are people going to be properly protected in relation to what techniques can now be used? And we know that the law is often slow and we know that legislation is often playing catch up. But at the moment, it's too slow. And there seems to be no desire to deal with this, perhaps until it happens to a politician. Yeah. And well, just to, to challenge you a little bit on that, because this is something that I've, I've struggled with for a while. And it's often because of that lag between law and technology, often Silicon Valley types are saying, well, to hell with the law, then the law is always going to be an ass. So let's, let's build technology right, and then we'll solve all the world's problems, which then brings us to perhaps the, the most amusing and pathetic of the stories I wanted to cover. So Philips has these uh, smart bulbs that yet again, some researchers have developed an exploit to show that they can basically take over home networks as a result of a problem in these in these light bulbs. The biggest problem, though, is that this isn't the first time, and it's because they were able to exploit a vulnerability that was identified in the light bulbs in 2016. The problem, though, is that they can't update the firmware of the light bulbs. So all these light bulbs are deployed all around the planet. They're in homes, they're in offices, they're connected for some godforsaken reason to networks. And they make these networks vulnerable as a result of them being on there. And you can't fix it because they weren't designed to allow for a hardware update, which is just nuts that we've built a world where a light bulb can be a point of vulnerability. And that's certainly an area that's increasingly of interest to a lot of the vendors of this technology is internet connected devices or IoT devices, however you want to call them, or wearable tech. We're talking about health tech. We're even talking about devices that you use in terms of your kids or monitoring at home that you wouldn't necessarily see as part of this issue. But because it reveals so much about you and the data is stored in the cloud, this is what we're talking about. And if you can't secure the physical device that then allows this kind of data to be uploaded, you can't rectify it. What does it mean if that's not just a light bulb, which perhaps you could replace if you were told, you know what, if you've got one from 2016, buy our one now. What if it's inside your body? How are you meant to go about that kind of procedure if all of that information is being used to track your health and is being stored in the cloud? And then we say, do you know what, that's all vulnerable to these kind of technologies. And the company, well, how can they respond if they haven't thought about this? And this is so this is one of the reasons we have this podcast series, but it's also exactly what I, was, I wanted to challenge you on about this whole technology versus law. The reality is they're both asses. You know, it, it, the fact that we have all this 
posturing from the companies about, oh, we protect your data, yet they're not responding to you as you do your research on cloud extraction. The fact that Apple uh, will fight the FBI to keep the phone secure, but will acquiesce to keeping the data unencrypted on Apple's own servers. The fact that law enforcement uh, and immigration enforcement is accessing location data via weather apps that are stored in, in data brokers. There's just this and then there's light bulbs that can make your entire network vulnerable. And the idea of a smart bulb is to improve the environment by reducing waste. But if you, if, if you want an update, you're going to have to buy a new one for what should be a perfectly functioning light bulb. This just doesn't make any sense. This is not the world that we were promised. It's not. But then I guess if you turn that around, you could say there are lots of different people we could put pressure on to address this situation as much as PI we can take this forward and put pressure on companies, we can put pressure on law enforcement, we can try and put pressure on government. Individuals can do that too and help us to make our voice louder. Whereas I guess even though it, it sounds worse than what could happen before, before what different pressure points necessarily existed if you felt something was wrong? How much change could you get if you your only point was law enforcement well what if we can use the companies to put pressure on law enforcement as well as us what if people can put pressure on the companies and what if all of those can then put pressure on the government and say you know what something has to change because the companies are annoyed because they're getting so much pressure from their customers law enforcement annoyed because cases are going wrong and being dropped because of the quality of the evidence and and so then at least you get some kind of momentum to create a change that won't necessarily be perfect because we all know when laws are created, they're not, but at least have the discussion that is decidedly absent right now among people and companies and people thinking, well, we've got to do something. There's no perfect solution, but this is the world that we've created. It's not the one that necessarily as individuals we were promised but it's one that we can deal with damn damn Millie. like I, I sit across from you in the office and we never get to have conversations <laughs> like these this is wonderful <laughs> thank you very much so thank you everyone for joining us on this reboot of our podcast it would really help if you would subscribe or like the podcast and of course at any point come to our website at uh, www.privacyinternational.org. And we also are developing new ways for you to sign up to mailings about our work as it happens, before it happens, and some reflections after the fact. So yes, please come to our website and sign up. And you can always follow us on social media. We're hoping to keep this on a monthly basis so that I'll be back with some other colleagues next month talking about some new and exciting work that they're always up to here, which kind of blows my mind. And I technically run the office. So yeah, thanks for listening. The music is courtesy of Sepia. And this podcast was produced by Max Burnell for Privacy International. Thank you. Thank you.